Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about ordinary people with extraordinary stories. I'm delighted to welcome special guest Tim Heal from England. Tim is retired from serving in the British Army and is currently a vlogger and the host of the podcast Ordinary People, Extraordinary Stories, and I'll include a link in the description. Welcome, Tim. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. No, thank you for having me. It is. I'm looking forward to it. I am too. I am excited to be hearing stories because I looked at your your video about your podcast and about uh, recording stories for posterity so that we leave this legacy. And you have so many stories to tell with your incredible experiences in so many different things, your military experiences. Plus, you sailed around England. Plus, you are down here race ski racer. Plus, you've done this. Plus, you've done that. And I think, oh, my. So I am excited to hear some stories. Do you want to start with some military experiences? Or Oh, could do. I mean, I, I joined the British Army on the 5th of August, 1974. Uh and I, I, I turned up at a depot of the Queen's Division as a, a, a junior soldier in the Royal Anglian Regiment. And we were one of, one of the only regiments still in, kind of in existence in, its, in the form that it was when I joined it. There's been an awful lot of amalgamations and, uh, and disbandments of, of regiments in the British Army over the, the the last 40 odd years it, you just wouldn't believe however um i went through training uh, and my first posting was to germany and uh i i, I set off with a few other guys and we we arrived in in munster in germany the battalion was away in northern ireland at the time we were we were only 17 so we weren't allowed to go to northern ireland so they stuck us on rear party <laughs> which which means a lot of guards and uh, a lot of sweeping up leaves. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to go to Germany and sweep up leaves. Oh, yes. I'm proficient with the broom <laughs> and the shovel. <laughs> Excellent. No rakes, huh? Well, no, they didn't really need rakes for these leaves. I mean, <laughs> they were just, in, just covered the camp. Uh, and we just spent all our time brushing, picking up leaves, taking them to the top of camp dumping them off for them to blow back down again <laughs> just to keep us going. Um, and I ended up being on, on Christmas Guard. Uh, so the battalion had just, just returned and they all went off on Christmas leave and they left us rear party on Christmas duties. Oh, shoot. But it wasn't too bad because um, Christmas morning, the uh, the officers and the, the, the senior NCOs came round, woke us up, with a mug of tea and a, a, a big slug of whiskey on Christmas morning. <laughs> and that's how you started the day. <laughs> that's how the day started. And then we were on guard. And, uh, yeah, we had, we had a couple of drinks while we were on guard. We shouldn't have done, but we did. Um, and then we were um, – those were on Christmas Day. Didn't get to do New, New Year's Eve. So we, we, had a, we had a good old go on New Year's Eve as well. So that's, that's how I started off in the British Army. Wow, that sounds so exciting. Here you are signing up as this young 17-year-old thinking you're going to, you know, serve queen and country and travel the world. And instead, you get to go to Germany and sweeping and shoveling leaves (laughs) and sitting there on Christmas. And uh, yeah, not quite what you had in mind, I imagine. No, I mean, they, they... They, they do have a habit of lying to you in the recruiting office. <laughs> I think you're the only person that's ever been lied to in a recruiting office. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was gullible. I was young. What can I say? <laughs> Is it normal to be able to join when you're only 17? In the British Army, yes. Uh, you, you can actually join at 16. Um, really? We have a – it's now uh, an Army Foundation College. Um, so, so young kids coming out of school, uh, they can join up at, at sixteen, they, and it's a longer course now. I, I think they do forty-two weeks at Harrogate, which is a um, they they learn all the, the skills and drills, but they they bring them up as leaders. So they they'll they'll 
they give them a lot more skills and, and, and build on leadership. Uh, so when, when they come out and they go off to the battalions, then uh, or to their regiments or corps, they, they've got a bit more in-depth knowledge and they tend to progress through the rank structure fairly quickly mm. because they, they've, they've had that leadership training. Whereas somebody coming in at sort of 17, 18, um, just does the basic training of, I think it's 12, 16 weeks, something like that, before they go off and do the trade training or, um, or, or they go off to the units. So after so 12 weeks, you are suited to sweep leaves but after yep. 42 weeks, you can maybe do something else. Yeah, you can instruct people how to sweep leaves. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I could think of worse things that could happen in a military experience. Did well, you ever yeah. get uh, have to have to fight or anything? Well, I mean, it involved a bit of fighting, but that was generally downtown <laughs> on the weekend. <laughs> Come Monday. Come Monday morning, I mean, <laughs> when, I, when I joined the British Army, it, it was a drinking culture. And people said that we were um, functioning alcoholics. <laughs> <laughs> functioning alcoholics. Well, good yeah. to know that Britain I mean, is safe. <laughs> it's well known that a British soldier <laughs> can, can go out and drink all night uh, and, and at six o'clock the following morning, he'll be on parade ready to do a 10-mile march, no problem at all. Really? Is it really no problem at all? I would imagine you no, have quite a hangover. You get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in the mind. <laughs> Tim, that is such a different mental image than what I see of this, you know, proper British soldier doing all these things. And you did some of the, uh, let's see, the ceremonial duties later, right? <laughs> I, I did. I, I spent my last last eight years as a unit welfare welfare officer for London Central Garrison. Now the garrison's main role was um, ceremonial duties. So we had the three uh, we had three companies of foot guards, um, which was uh, Nine Maiden Company Grenadier Guards, who were the ex Second Battalion. We had number seven company Colstring Guards, which were the second battalion, and we had F Company Scots Guards, which were the second battalion of the Scots Guards. Those second battalions um, were disbanded in 1994 under what they called Options for Change, but they kept on the, those three companies to do public duties. So their main role was to do public duties. So the guys coming out of out of training, they would come down to, to the companies, they would learn to do the ceremonial piece, they would do the vast bulk of the Queen's Guards. And the Queen's Guards um, takes 48 guys uh, to do um, Buckingham Palace, St James's Palace and the Tower of London. So that's, that's the three duties in London. And then you get another 12 guys go out to Windsor to do the Windsor Guard on Windsor Castle. So did you rotate and do all of those? Or did you just stick with one? Because I was the welfare officer. I mean, I, 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 I went on as senior sergeant for to, to cover for some of the, some of the duties. Mm. But I used to go round the, the, the different guard rooms, round the different palaces, um, just to check up on the guys to see how they were and make sure that the, the boots fitted and the food was getting through and, they didn't have any dramas. <laughs> they always had dramas. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a real privilege to, to, to do that. I mean, I'm not a guardsman. I, I'm a proper infantry soldier. But, um, yeah, it, it was fun working with them. And particularly on the Queen's Birthday Parade. Um, the Queen's Birthday Parade is Troop in the Colour. So with an infantry regiment, we have colours. And the colours is what? guys uh, rally around in battle and they live and die for, for the colours. And, and me being a colour sergeant, I, I'm, I'm entitled to escort the colours, which is a real privilege. And I have done it on a few occasions. So the Queen's Birthday Parade, if you've seen it on the television, uh, you've got seven guards. Of, of uh, Each guard is made up of 66 rank of file. 
So you've got seven lots of 66 guys and they all marched around in synchronized marching. And, um, and then you've got the, the, the mass bands of the household division. So you've got the two extra bands, the Welsh Guards and the Irish Guards, uh, with the other three um, bands. And it's a big ceremony, the Queen's there and all the rest of it. But my job, <laughs> get this, I was up here outside what used to be Wellington's office, looking after the minor royals to make sure that nobody got through that shouldn't have got through to see the royals or the minor royals. So the likes of Prince Harry, uh, William was outside because he's, he's in line, but um, Kate, Camilla, um, the Gloucesters, the, the Kents, um, all the minors. So, yeah, and that, that was a great day. And, and that was always taking liberties. <laughs> so you got to hang out with Prince Harry for a day, huh? Yeah, yeah. That's before he went all funny on us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's on that at the moment. He's right under the thumb. Oh, really? Yeah. You know, I see the tabloids, <laughs> but I'm not sure exactly what to believe, you know, when you, it's like, ah, I hear this story and that story, and who's telling the truth? Well, yeah. But, um, yeah, he's not done himself any favors whatsoever. Well, I guess that's go. life choices, and some people have their life choices displayed before Absolutely. the whole world. He's his great uncle did similar with Mrs. Simpson, didn't he? Yeah, you kind of get your well. Yeah. People make their choices, and absolutely, and they get to live with it. And most of us, we get to make our choices in in private. And some people, they make their choices, and then the whole world judges them, which is absolutely really harsh. That's really it harsh. Can be. I think I think for the most part, we're all doing the best we can, and that is yeah. what it is. Well, in addition to that, I mean, you're doing all this stuff. When did you fit in your hang gliding instructing? Oh, that was early on in my career. Um, we'd, we'd, we'd just been on a two-year posting in uh, Northern Ireland. We were up in Londonderry for two years. And during that period, this is 40 years ago now, because I know it's 40 years ago because we were in Northern Ireland uh, when the Falklands War happened. Oh. And we were having a pretty rough time. Um, lots and lots of incidents going off, lots of problems um, across the province, and we were involved with lots of that. So it wasn't great for us at that time, but that, that was on a two-year resident posting. And um, at the end of that posting, the battalion was being posted to Colchester uh, in Essex, and I got posted to um, Sennybridge in Wales to what was then the Army Hang Gliding Centre. And I was going there as a storm and clerk. Hadn't got a clue what hang gliding was when I got there, but I soon found out, and within, within a couple of weeks being there, the, the boss of the unit stuck me on the course, and uh, and I was flying most weeks, uh, and, and I progressed really rapidly. Uh, and after a year, I, I took... Um, my instructor's ticket and, and then I was going out every day teaching guys that were coming through uh, hang gliding and hang gliding for the British Army at that time was an adventurous training sport and adventurous training is a large part of what British military is all about and um, it builds in robustness it, it gives guys confidence it does team building all that sort of thing and okay. that's, that's where Adventurous training comes in with the British Army. People think it's an holiday. It ain't an holiday. Not a holiday. <laughs> no, the British Army know how to muck up a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating. So doing that was intended to help build confidence, to build strength, to build teamwork. And so it this is, is this team building exercise. Fascinating. Yeah, it's the same with the skiing. It's the same with the sailing. I mean, the skiing, um, I, I learned to ski an awful long time ago. And um, I first learned to ski the army way um, uh, on what they call pusses planks in Norway in the middle of winter 
Um, you either got a big pack on your back or you're dragging a pork behind you with all your kit in. And um, you spent three months sort of start <laughs> skating around like Bambi on ice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on, 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 on sort of wooden planks and, and leather boots. Um, but I got the hang of it. And the second year I went back, really got the hang of it. Um, and and then I just went skiing every year by myself or or off off of the army, um, different. And, and I used to free hill ski, which developed into um, telemark skiing. And, and when I converted over to, to plastic boots and wasted skis, so skis with a waist on, transformed the way I skied. And, um, and then I started competing as well. And, um, I was on the, the first army telemark team to take on the Royal Navy, uh, in a place called Le Memoir in France. And we won. <laughs> Congratulations. That's so exciting. That's something that you get to hold on to and remember your whole life. We yeah. won. So I looked up because telemark skiing, that word is new to me. I had to look it up. It's like, what is telemark skiing? So it's with snow skiing that combines alpine and Nordic skiing using a squatting motion on downhill skis. So I thought, okay, I didn't even know that that was a thing. Well, it's 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 a great way to ski. It you look so elegant. Mm. Well, I look elegant. Oh, of course you do. Um, it, because it's a different technique. Lots of people say, oh, it looks really hard. It's, I mean, it's a bit hard on your thighs, but the boots are far more comfortable than alpine skis, uh, ski boots. I mean, the, the, your foot's clamped in, you, you can't breathe, and, oh, they're terrible things. I mean, I can't alpine ski. I put my hand up. I can't alpine ski. However, I can ski as well as most alpine skiers downhill on my uh, – on my telemark skis, and yeah, I mean, I used to race, um, and and telemark ski racing is phenomenal to watch. It's great; it's a great spectator sport because, um, whereas you got like um, a GS course with, with alpine skiing, they're just flat out um, and top to bottom through a few gates. Bottom. Telemark skiing is same course, slightly different angles to to go through the gates, and you have to. Some guys you have to go through in a telemark stance. So you've got one foot back and, and you're squatting. Then you've got a jump to go over. And then you've got a 360 degree wrap to go round. And then you've got a skate section. And the skate section is normally uphill, <laughs> which takes the fun out of it a bit. Uh, so yeah. by, by the time you get to the, to the end of, of the GS, I mean, you, you are breathing rather heavily. And it doesn't matter who you are. You're breathing heavily at the end of it. <laughs> that is amazing. Okay, so it was through your military experience that you went into the hang gliding, and through that that you got into your skiing, and through that you got into your sailing. So I'm looking forward to hearing yeah. some of your sailing stories, because you sailed all the way around England, it says, with just your wife and your cat? Yep. And and, and RT the ship's cat, he's famous. He has got a, I think it's a, a 14 page spread in this year's edition of the Royal National Lifeboat Institute's yearbook. Really? Really. How they managed to get a 14 page spread out of his little rescue, we're not quite sure. But so. Rescue? The, it needed rescuing? The cat needed rescuing? No, not really. It was us that they needed rescuing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's a story here that I don't know. Will there, you tell me? There is me? a little bit of a story. We, after the, 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 the first lockdown, it was about the 9th of July, 2020. We were desperate to get away on the boat. We had, we had, from, from, from when they locked us down in, in, the, in the March to the, to the um, July, we couldn't even get access to the boat. We weren't allowed to, out of the house, anything like that. We were desperate to get away. So... We're talking COVID, we right? Able, COVID yeah. shut down? Okay. So as soon as we were able to, we jumped on the boat. We, we did um, a 30, 32 hours from Gosport to the Isles of Scilly. So it's oh, an no. overnight passage. 
um, and we arrived in the Isles of Shelley. Had a lovely couple of weeks there, um, going around the different anchorages, um, and, and a really nice time. And and then we sort of said, well, why don't we tick off a bucket list and go around the UK? Why well, not? In hindsight, that was possibly a little bit of an error because it was it's, it's slightly too late in the season to set off to go around the, the, the western coast of Scotland. But mm. we did. So anyway, cut along to so we saw We went up uh, the, the Irish Sea. We had a, a quick overnight stop in um, Arklo because we were kind of exhausted having been battered for the best part of, sort of two and a half days. So we, we, Ireland was still shut, so they wouldn't, they weren't going to let us in, but I mean, we, we claimed refuge. So they let us come in for a night. They weren't, we weren't allowed to get off the boat, but out the Scarborough in the morning. Then we, we, we carried on and we went into, um, into Northern Ireland and we had a couple of days there catching up with a few friends. And then we went off into the Western Isles and, uh, and had some fun around the Western Isles for a few weeks and uh, battling with the, the midges. And Scotland's famous for its midges. I mean, during the winter, they're, they're, they're about this sort of big. And then in the summer, when they take their fur coats off, they're tiny little things, but they're savage. I mean, they're, they're, they'll eat you alive. Well, we, had a, we had a couple of episodes of being eaten alive by the midges. Um, but we went through the, the Caledonian Canal um, and had a great time going through there. And then we got to Inverness, which is on the west coast, uh, the east coast of Scotland. And we been stuck there for, for about nine days waiting for a, a weather window to be able to, to leave. We had a few storms in, in that late late August. And um, we got a weather window that we planned on doing 630 miles, one hit from Inverness back to Gosport. So we set off, sails up, and we had a cracking sail for the first three days. And we just going into the, to the third night. The wind had started dying off a little bit. It was a bit overcast, so the solar panels weren't actually beefing up the, the batteries that well that particular day. Um, so we put a donkey on to do a bit of, um, to charge the batteries and, and a bit of motor sailing, as you do. We were about, um, we were about 300 miles south of Inverness. Again, really, it's one of those really pitch black nights. You can't see anything. Uh, no stars out or anything like that. And all of a sudden, boom, there's a big boom. Not going, the engine stopped. Uh-oh. So um, I, I started the engine again and, and we weren't moving. So on, on inspection, we've picked up a line of lob- lobster pots. Ooh. And we're held fast. Oops. We were going nowhere. So I put a call into the, into the um, Coast Guard just to let them know we've got a slight problem we're stuck um on a lobster pot but we're just just at the side of the shipping lane and the you know, new ship's coming up and down um i said oh that's not a problem we'll we'll get the lifeboat out to you um they've got some big lights on that you about to see what you're doing then so they sent out the lifeboat um and it was it was about seven hours later that um that they managed to get us free and we were able to carry on. By which time we've lost, um, lost the wind, lost our chance of uh, of being able to sail all the way back. And we ended up going another sixty miles south into a place called Grimsby. But <laughs> the lifeboat guy that came on the boat saw the ship's cat in his life jacket because we all had our life jackets on at night. We always put the life jackets on at night, uh, and 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 I'd see the ship's cat. He, he he was normally on the night watch. Whoever was up on, on deck for night watch, he, he would um, be sat alongside him. So so this story got back and um, it, it kind of escalated from there. <laughs> we were on the local news and we were in the papers and all sorts of things. Um, and then they, they featured us in this year's yearbook for the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. Your cat? They love, a, they love an animal story. <laughs> wears a life jacket and doesn't oh, yeah, yeah. freak out about being on a boat in the water. No, no problem. No. Well, from the day that we got him, um, he, he was just used to going on the boat. I mean, he'd say, come on in, in your box, we're off. 
and he'll get his, his, his carry box and, and off we go and, and, and he still does to this day so that's he, amazing he's a super cat how old but is the a, cat? he's, a, he's he'll be four in, next month okay we should have called him Wellington because oh. he was born on the 18th of June which is the, the Battle of Waterloo oh gotcha Wellington yeah yeah. You know, we had a bit of a parlay with, a bit of a rut with uh, old Napoleon Bonaparte. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> eight, that was a while 15. ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And say so Nelson gave him a, <laughs> a bit of a bloody nose at um, Trafalgar as well in 1805. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the whole world thanks you for that one. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good job. Good job. That's amazing. So how long did it take to get all the way around the UK? How, how uh, It took us, I think, nine weeks in total. Nine weeks? Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was great fun. That sounds like a great adventure. So I'm assuming that you have your own, you have your own boat. We did. We sold it last year um, for medical reasons more than anything. Okay. Well, that's a grand adventure. Okay, so all these amazing things. Now, you also played rugby and football. Is that with the military? American football. Is that through the, the, the military as well? Well, I played rugby with the military, yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I, I played from when I was a schoolboy right up until I was 56. Wow. I, I had my last, last game when I was 56 for the Royal Anglian Veterans Team and – the veterans team have a match against one of the um, one of the local teams in our recruiting area because we're recruited from the whole of the east of England, um, from sort of Lincolnshire, Leicestershire, Northamptonshire, Norfolk, Suffolk, Cams, and Bedsharts and Essex. So each each year we just before a regimental gathering, which is on a Sunday. Uh, we have a rugby match on the Saturday to raise funds for our benevolent fund. So, so I used to play for them nearly every year. I used to play for for a local team, uh, my local team, which uh, the Old Cats in Caterham. I played for them quite a, quite a few years. You are quite and I a played guy. Played scrum off. So, I guess in American football, it's, it's like I suppose it's a bit like a quarterback. Okay. Yes. Thank Only you. you have I'm to not be super far familiar. More in. Far more intelligent to be a scrum half at rugby. Far more intelligent <laughs> to be playing rugby. Of course, obviously. So what on earth led you to American football? Where where did that one fit in? Well, I, I was uh, I was living in a place called Milton Keynes in the middle of England. And um, back in the uh, late 80s, American football was, was fairly big in, in England at the time. Really? And... Uh, uh, and I went and played for, they were looking for recruits to, to play, and I thought, I'd give that a bash. Because when I was in Berlin, I, I used to watch a lot of American football. I thought it'd be great to have, have a bash here one day. So uh, I think it was about 1987, I, I joined a, a team called the Milton Keynes Pioneers, and they were playing at a national level. <laughs> I played on the defence. I was I was a, either outside linebacker, or occasionally dropped in at, uh, at um, tight end uh, and, and just had some fun. So uh, that's, that's, that was my <laughs> venture into American football. And then in 1988, we were conference champions um, for that year. So we, we, we won everything in our, our national division. That is amazing. What an extraordinary life you have lived and are still living. Well, thank yep. you so much for sharing your stories today. No, thank you for having me. In closing, I'd like to share a quote by Darren Kagan. He said, Bad things do happen in the, war in the world, like war, natural disasters, disease. But out of those situations always arise stories of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Today, I invite you to do extraordinary things and to share your stories. See you next time on Linda's Corner. Thanks for listening. 
If you enjoyed this episode of Linda's Corner, please share and subscribe to help us reach new listeners. I also invite you to check out my nonprofit, Hope for Healing, at the website hopeforhealingfoundation.org for free ebooks and other free resources to help increase happiness, build confidence and self esteem, strengthen relationships, manage stress, and calm feelings of depression and anxiety. I also invite you to grab a copy of one of my books, like Crushed A Journey Through Depression, or Amazon bestseller You Got This, an action plan to calm fear, anxiety, worry, and stress. See you next time on Linda's Corner.